trying to eliminate from your gardens. Several thousand years ago in this part of the country, much of eastern U.S. up into eastern Canada, these same plants were very, very important in the subsistence systems of native peoples. In fact, some of them became domesticated thousands of years ago and were grown as field crops. And a lot of people, and I enjoy this with students uh, at, at, at the university, uh, who always have it, this mindset that native peoples grew corn, beans, and squash. Uh, yes, they did eventually. Uh, not originally. Beans are not native to this part of the world, the domesticated bean. Corn, maize is not native to this part of the world. There is a, quote, squash, which to me will always be a culinary term, not a botanical term. Uh, but uh, squash, there is a domesticated native squash in eastern North America. It's in the same genus, the same botanical species as the things people think of, the thing of pumpkins, which are Mexican. They're, they're not from up here. But they're, they're, there are two subspecies, and I'll, I'll get to those in just a minute. But what I, I want to do is let you know that people in what is now, well, in Eastern North America, and I'll leave the U.S. out of it, uh, have had a relationship since the end of the last ice age with the plants I'm going to talk about. And basically, we're going to talk about seven. They're all native, uh, but seven of them because they were so important. Uh, these are all in one context or another, weeds. Some of them you're familiar with, I'm sure. Goosefoot, lamb's quarter. Anybody familiar? Mm -hmm. Okay. Please don't kill that plant. Uh, <laughs> uh, others who are, uh, there are other names we'll go through, and again, including the squash. But people have been <clears throat> associated with these plants uh, since the end of the uh, last ice age, and especially beginning about 8,000 years ago. There was a massive climate change in North America beginning about 8,000 years ago, up until about 4,000 years ago. The Middle Holocene, the Ipsythermal scientists called what it was, surprise, surprise, was a warming of the climate and a, a drying in our part of the world. Areas in Middle Tennessee that were oak hickory forests uh, morphed into prairies, prairie remnants. There was a migration of prairie vegetation across the Mississippi into this part of the country. Climate change, the vegetation change. People began to settle more regularly about this time in the major river valleys. Think of the Tennessee River Valley, even around here in East Tennessee, if you wish. That's very apropos. The um, runoffs from the glacier melt had abated somewhat, well, actually a lot. But uh, people were spending more time in the same places over and over again. And if you think about being a native person living in the Tennessee River Valley, what were you doing? When you get up, you're getting firewood or wood for building, you're going out gathering a lot of the riverine resources, which means you're moving through the same areas over and over. There was a lot of regularity and predictability in what you were doing. And as you're doing this day after day, month after month, year after year, you're affecting the way plants are distributed on the landscape. You're opening things up. You're also doing things like setting fires to create edge areas that attract more deer and attract turkey and attract other things that you're interested in. And as you do that, you're creating habitats that these plants we're going to talk about just love. They thrive in these open, disturbed habitats <clears throat> without something or somebody consistently and on a regular basis disturbing this landscape, opening it up, keeping it from going back to forest cover. These things won't last. They are real competitive early on. They produce a whole lot of children, a lot of seeds, but not very successfully over the long term. If they begin to get shaded out, they begin to disappear. So over the long haul, you know that people are doing the same kinds of things in the landscapes over and over and over to create habitats that these plants like. Now, what I want to do is give you a couple of images of how we get this information I want to talk about. Because it's basically recovered from archaeological excavations. <clears throat> and we get these charred, usually, fragments of plants out of the ground, <clears throat> process them, put them in a laboratory, and 
try to identify. And let me tell you, if you want to have an incredibly exciting and thrilling week, get a two millimeter diameter piece of wood charcoal and have someone say, well, gee, what kind of tree is that? But we can do that. Uh, it all comes down to the comparative collections. But we, we can do that. Uh, let me show you. <clears throat> if you look in the upper left there, that dark stain, that's actually an archaeological site. <laughs> that, uh, that comes from the organic matter that's in the soil, from people having lived there for several hundred years, about 2,000 years ago. And this is down in South Central Tennessee, and that's the Elk River. There. And you might be able to see folks right there who are actually beginning to do some testing. <clears throat> After you get find these things out, we do some surface collecting to find the hot spots. You'll see this sort of thing happen: uh, removing the topsoil that's accumulated over a couple of thousand years to get down to the living surface where the people were. And down at there, you'll see. Uh, well, no technology is going to work today, is it? <laughs> There it is. You'll see these little pits, post holes, uh, and so forth that are being excavated that contain the materials that we're looking for. And I really like this picture. That's really early in the summer field season, excavating this site. And what do you think gives you the first clue that that's early in the summer field season? That's really good. But you know what always sticks out to me? Look at this pasty white belly. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He hasn't been out in the sun very long. Okay? That's, that guy was, from, guy was from Florida working on our field group. But, and here's another place, deeply buried sites. This is over in the Teleco Reservoir area. Uh, several meters down below the surface is the level at which people were actually living on the ground surface uh, 8,000, 9,000 years ago. And another one of the big storage pits. Uh, again, just different kinds of context from which we get the materials. <clears throat> this is called water flotation, and it's a misnomer. You don't really float it. You, you take the material you excavate from these pits and so forth, put it in these big drums, uh, run water into the bottom, run them out over a sluice into these buckets that have sieves, uh, geologic sieves in it down to half a uh, millimeter diameter to catch the charcoal and so forth and so on that is dried and taken to a laboratory, size sorted and put under a microscope and we begin to, to define what we're seeing here to describe the plant material. Now, they're the plants that we're really interested in. And I had examples of them up here. <clears throat> but, uh, and we'll be going from here on down the list, not because one's more important than the other, but that's the way I have my slides arranged. Okay, uh, We'll do that. The, the squash. There is this, colloquially known as an egg gourd. And I have examples of them up here that you can see. Um, but this, that's the botanical name up there. It is native, uh, and it still grows in the Tennessee River Valley over in West Tennessee. Uh, and there is a 7,000 year record of that plant with people living in the mm -hmm. Eastern North America. I don't think that they were eating any of this, except maybe the seeds. It's an incredibly bitter uh, fruit, the material inside of it, to quote meat. But uh, they make nifty little tools. There have been suggestions of them being used as floats uh, and, and other things. But the seeds are edible. And that's a typical habitat right there. They are transported by flood waters along these streams. They're climbers. That's <laughs> growing up in, uh, right there. Uh, that's a typical for that plant. And we know that by 5,000 years ago, uh, there were changes in the plant that indicate that it had become domesticated. And the changes that we can see are two. Number one, the seeds get much larger than the wild versions of the seeds, uh, typically up to 11 millimeters in length instead of tiny little things that you can see here later. Uh, and the other is that the rind thickness increases under domestication. Uh, that's actually a photograph of the oldest known domesticated squash material in, in uh, North America, right there. That's uh, South Central Missouri. It had been preserved in a spring, and that's why we still have it there with us. All right, another. Everybody knows this plant. Uh, most everybody, I suppose, grows some version of it during the summer. Uh, but it, the, what became domesticated here 
It is not native to here. Uh, the Four Corners, are you familiar with that? It, in the Southwest, Colorado, Utah, <clears throat> New Mexico, and Arizona come together at one spot. It's the only place in the U.S. where that happens, uh, in the Four Corners area. And the uh, annual sunflower uh, that became domesticated here is from that area. And the oldest evidence of a domesticated sunflower anywhere on this planet is from Middle Tennessee. And at 4,800 years old, and these dates that, that you'll see when you see them and I speak of them, are all radiocarbon dates that have been calibrated to tree rings and we can get down within usually 30 to 50 years one way or the other in terms of the accuracy of the date. And when you're talking about thousands of years back, that's pretty tight. It's not like, you know, okay, well, it's down deeper in the ground, so it must be older than this thing up here. But uh, the domestication of this plant, which is an oily seeded plant, most people who have ever been around it know that, it's a good source of calories, energy, a uh, good source of vitamins, thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, uh, as I said, good calories, it's good energy food. Uh, it does produce under domestication a larger seed, technically a fruit, larger seed and larger discs. Uh, we watch these things increase through time uh, in, the, in the archaeological record. And once we get up uh, to uh, seeds that as a group are over six millimeters in length, we've seen enough of a genetic change in the plants that we know that they're much bigger than wild populations of the this, of this same plant. And some of them are, are really incredibly, incredibly larger than, than the wild sunflowers. Uh, the, uh, there. That thing on the right, uh, that disc before it was dried, uh, put it in a, a, a botanical oven to, to dry, weighed 15 pounds. <laughs> and there were over 2,000 seeds on that head. Uh, and that guy was fat, five nine, something like that. So that's that's a that's a large plant. But you can thank the Russians for that. Uh, that's native people didn't do that. Uh, the Russians did. The Russians and the Canadians are the ones who have done so much of the work with sunflowers because they're interested in oil primarily. But this, the seeds are popular for a lot of things. But uh, it is this process over time of this plant, this wild sunflower, being around people. <clears throat> people maintaining habitat that it likes, it begins to take advantage of that, and then people begin to select certain plants, fruits or seeds from certain plants that, that they have out there that they like. And over time, this system just feeds on itself, and you begin to see these larger seeds. There, there's an example of seed, seed size increase through time. Uh, and these are all from Tennessee, all of these seeds are. That's a, that's a pretty dramatic change, to tell you the truth. Uh, and there's no technology involved there other than selecting for things that you like. The size of the fruit, the size of the disc, so forth and so on. Okay. In the same family as sunflower is this thing called sumpweed. It doesn't sound very appetizing. And unless you get the kernels out of the little husk, it's not very appetizing. Uh, it's pretty rank, as a matter of fact. But it actually does uh, look like a, uh, there's a summer and autumn version uh, of the plant. It is native uh, to a lot of areas of the eastern <clears throat> part of North America and it's easily harvested in the fall. You can just strip the seeds off of the thing or you can even pull the plants out of the ground. They're very shallowly rooted. Uh, they, they come out very easy. Um, there. There's the kernel once you get it out of this thing, out of the husk, just like a sunflower. That is actually quite tasty. Tastes kind of nutty flavor to it. Now, if you can find the populations of some weed, congratulations. That, that it likes a, again, open, sunny, moist place. And most of those places that are, are disappearing very rapidly. Uh, the last place that I knew where to collect this plant in the Knoxville area <clears throat> was at Turkey Creek. But no more. Uh, it's gone. Uh, and this, just to give you an idea, those two top seeds there are modern wild examples. 
Those on the bottom, and that one in the middle is broken, but those on the bottom are all prehistoric, and they're from domesticated populations of the same plant. So like sunflower, it gets bigger through time. Also like sunflower, it's an oily, oily seed, water, a lot of calories, a lot of energy, same, uh, very similar vitamin makeup. It also uh, helps with some amino acid deficiencies in other plants, uh, specifically lysine, uh, that's really good for people. But this is a, a some weed kernels are really a very, very uh, nutritious uh, food source, good protein, uh, a lot of carbohydrates, uh, iron, dietary iron. Uh, it's a very nutritious plant. We know of no historic records of the plant uh, leaves or stems being used. Uh, it's not a very touchy-feely kind of plant. Uh, a lot of real stiff hairs on it, on the leaves, and <clears throat> we can't, when you can't find uh, historic records from the early, say, 16th century and 1500s from the Europeans who were touring through the southeast and uh, up into the northeast, if you can't find records of native groups using parts of a plant from what they wrote, uh, there's, it, it's going to be difficult to find them any time, and I've talked with uh, people in Cherokee, over in North Carolina, uh, and I can't find anyone who has a, uh, an oral history for the use of anything other than the, uh, the seeds of this plant uh, there through time. This domesticated form disappears at around 1500, just after that, 1500 AD and just after that, and there are a couple of probabilities in terms of why. Number one, by that time the Europeans were moving around here in this part of the country and they were bringing in African fruits that are beginning to show up. Cow peas, okra, uh, and some melons uh, coming in, a lot of that sort of thing. There, were, uh, there, were, there was another thing that was even bigger. Uh, by this time, maize, corn, had become an incredibly important food resource to native peoples in the uh, eastern North America. And while corn ultimately is nutritionally inferior to this, uh, substantially inferior, uh, on a 100-gram uh, a per 100-gram basis, corn is not nearly as nutritious as this, but what corn does is let you grow so that down much of it in a given area. And in this part of the country, you can grow two crops most of the time. The weather lets you do that. You go a little farther north and you run into problems growing two crops of corn, uh, unless you're into the hybrids that we're using today. And we're talking about open pollinated things, uh, none of the hybrids, none of this stuff that you know, was spliced to the back of a frog and whatever. Um, <laughs> but uh, those two are probably good reasons that this plant went extinct in, in a domesticated form. Now, this one, more people are probably familiar with this than most of the others. Uh, it's, uh, this plant also is not known for domestication. We can't identify it that way through increases in seed size. It's different. It adapted differently to opportunities on the landscape. <clears throat> it wanted to germinate more quickly. Now, I'm not saying plants have a plan. That's not what I'm saying. But if you're out here on the landscape as a lambsport or a goosefoot plant, and this creature over here is creating the environment that you really like, you take advantage of that. Just biologically, you take advantage of that. <clears throat> and one of the things that happens as the plants adapt to this constantly available habitat is they find a way to outcompete their neighbors, that is, to win space on the landscape get control of the soil nutrients and the water, and that is to germinate before the others do. If there are chenopodium plants that have seeds that are not going to germinate reliably, they may stay dormant for a long time. <clears throat> Some of these plants, by the way, which can produce over 100,000 seeds uh, on one plant, have seeds that have been tested to stay dormant for 20 years and then germinate. Uh, so, uh, because the seed coat is so thick, it can't get through. So one adaptation is to reduce the thickness of that seed coat, and you germinate more quickly. Now this, these images are from a scanning electron microscope. And what I'm talking about 
that real thick black thing, that's the seed coat. You're looking at a cross section down on the seed like this. Uh, you can see how thick that is. Typically on a wild kenopodium berlandieri seed, that would be more than 40 microns thick. That's more than 41 thousandths of a millimeter, which isn't much, but in the seed world, that's a lot. Uh, it's a thick. And what you're seeing here, that thing, that's the embryonic root. Root of a little embryo. The leaves of the embryo pushing on it. And all of this stuff in here, technically is called perisperm, is the food source for when the embryo germinates to get it started up. Now, this is the same species, but it's a domesticated form, and you're hard pressed to even see a seed coat. Unlike this, it's almost gone on there. And you can still see part of the embryonic root in the leaves, and look how much more food resource there is in there. So that thin seed coat, it germinates more reliably, and it's got all this food to feed on. So up it comes. And if you get a population of these things going, they're reliable and that's where you're going to go. And I can tell you that, uh, well, you may want to prostate some a little more, winnow them somewhat after you grind or crush up these seeds. Uh, they make a pretty good flour. Now, I, I have never you, tried to bake using nothing but kenopodium flour. Uh, it, it's too much work for me. Uh, to collect enough seeds process to do that. So I mix it in with wheat, do that, and what I get is this really nifty, swirly, black looking stuff in with the wheat uh, and whatever being baked. And it's not bad when it comes out of the oven, especially if you put some oil on it or, or butter or whatever. Uh, it's a little drier than what most people are accustomed to, but it's, it doesn't taste bad at all. And of course the other parts of the plant are also edible as a potter uh, earlier in the season. If you harvest the uh, vegetative part of the plant early enough in the season, it likely will grow back enough that it might still produce seeds for you in the fall. So it's, it's, a, it's a nifty, really a helpful resource. Here's another way to look at domestication, an impact of domestication in, this in, in the goosefoot. <clears throat> and you can see how scraggly this thing is, uh, and where the seeds would develop, where the flowers are right now. And that's the domesticated form. And what's happened is the seeds begin to compact into terminal parts of the branches, out at the ends of the branches, and they tend to mature at the same time. It makes it a lot easier to harvest more seeds to do that. And uh, so that, that's another adaptation by the plant. <clears throat> There's like a modern wild kenopodium seed right here, uh, looking at that fishnet pattern, which is classic. This one, 2,500 years old. One of the changes there, you see how flattened it is on the side? Right there. You remember, uh, there. You can see it here, how it begins to sort of get more little rectangular because of all that stuff pushing out on the seed coat <clears throat> because it's so thin. Well, that's what you're seeing there. And again, I showed you some pictures of places where we recover things like this. But there is one unequivocal source for where these things come from. If you want to know if somebody ate this, go there. Okay? This. Uh, those are 2,500 years old. And that domesticated seed I just showed you came out of one of those. As a matter of fact, over 80% of the organic matter uh, out, of, out of these samples, and there were many more, uh, was from domesticated native plants over 2,000 years ago. Including that kenopodium and some of this uh, sump weed, sunflower, uh, and some other plants. And there are other things in there too. I've seen bird feathers. Uh, I've seen uh, uh, out of one sample out of a uh, dry cave in Kentucky, uh, and it was rather a robust sample. But uh, there was part of a turkey foot in that one. Uh, and I, I try not to think about that too much, but, uh, but the people were eating a lot of things. There's a lot of nutshell that you'll see in there. <clears throat> now, this may be a plant that not a lot of people are familiar with. <clears throat> it is widely distributed all the way over to California and in northern Mexico, starting in the Carolinas. If you're familiar with what's called the fall line in the Carolinas, it separates the coastal plain from the mountains. Basically, think of the Piedmont. 
kind of thing in the Carolinas, coming around through central Georgia and Alabama and Mississippi and that sort of thing. It's native to there, but technically not native even to here. And by 4,000 years ago, it was an important food resource here. There's what the plant looks like. <clears throat> that was being grown in a garden at on the UT campus until they took that space away from me. Uh, they couldn't grasp the significance of growing weeds up uh, on the hill. Uh, but those are modern uh, grains or caryopsis there. <coughs> it's a spring maturing grass that uh, is really productive. And like the sump weed, uh, the grains of, of this plant, of the may grass here, uh, are just dynamite nutritional. They have a protein nutrient density that you have you can't beat until you're eating venison, turkey, and fish. And for a plant that's remarkable and for a grass that's just almost off the charts. I mean trying to think of that kind of protein nutrient density coming from a grass. But it's also a great source of dietary iron, thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, calcium, blah blah blah. I mean, this is a really nutritious thing, of course, really high in fiber. Uh, so it, and it's relatively low in calories. Per 100 grams serving of these grains when they're processed, 370 calories. Not much. Not much at all. When you think of uh, things like wall, uh, hickories, you know, way over 500 calories for the same serving. Uh, Some weed would be over 500 also, because it is an oily seeded plant, and quote squash uh, has a lot of calories. But this has wonderful nutrition package and not a lot of calories in real low fat. And because it's a starchy grain, like the uh, lamb's quarter, it stores really well. You, you don't have all this moisture in there like you do in sunflower and squash and some wheat that you have to worry about. So it stores really, really well. And there's a classic habitat. I can't remember what parish I was in when that photograph was taken, but I, I rarely knew where I was in Louisiana anyway. <laughs> uh, another grass, and it's native to the uh, eastern North America, the uh, little barley, Cordium pusillum, uh, another spring maturing grass, similar nutrition package, uh, and we do not have really any indications in terms of the morphology of the plant that it ever became domesticated, as with May grass. No indication that it became domesticated, but we know they were cultivated. By that I mean people were intentionally harvesting them, storing them, and replanting them. But the relationship did not become symbiotic enough or intense enough that it yielded genetic changes in the plant that you can see in the way that, uh, that it appears when you're looking at it. But uh, again, early, uh, early season plants here, this is really important. If you're storing things in the late summer and fall of this year, and they're going to have to get you through a winter, and you've got to make it till most things mature in the summer of the next year, summer and fall, not a lot of things mature in the spring. If you've got little barley and may grass maturing in the spring with the nutritional quality of those plants, hallelujah, uh, that, that can be a savior. Uh, and when you think about having to store these things underground uh, more often than not, and that actually does work. Uh, you lose some of the things around the edge of the storage facility uh, uh, that uh, it creates a, an environment that pests and uh, so forth don't like, so they stay out of there. Uh, so they store pretty well. There's the little barley. <clears throat> and it does, when it's very young, it looks so much like may grass, it's difficult to tell them apart, uh, but uh, they are easily. Uh, distinguish from one another when they're older, and the uh, grain right there uh, looks like the barley that was domesticated 10,000 years ago over in the Near East, except it's much smaller. And same genus, just a different species. Ah, erect knotweed. It's another starchy grain plant native. Uh, this is an interesting little plant because we're still working on it. There's a possibility that this plant actually was domesticated in prehistory. Uh, we've got to do some more work uh, on this thing to, to convince ourselves of it. I say ourselves, me, and other people who do the same kinds of things that I do. But um, 
this plant was incredibly important, especially in the Illinois River Valley for whatever reason. Uh, it's no better adapted to that area than it would be to the Tennessee River Valley. But a little over 2,000 years ago, it was harvested in a much greater intensity, much greater intensity than it was here. Uh, there are storage pits, underground storage pits, that I have seen excavated in Illinois where there literally are millions of the seeds, the Akeens, from this plant in one pit. <clears throat> and you start thinking about a seed that's a couple of millimeters, just over a couple of millimeters in length. Uh, that's a lot of plants and a lot of seeds and a lot of work. It was important to people. And when you also realize that uh, the only reason we can uncover these things and, and know this is that somehow somebody really made a mistake. You think about all this harvesting. One of the things you want to do is parch these things to keep, get, get rid of fungus and to, and to kill off any pests that might be in there. You parch them. Well, somebody, when you parch them enough that you can't eat them, and you're talking about millions of these things, someone put a lot of work <clears throat> into collecting all this stuff, then to have somebody else, probably, uh, I always like to think that uh, it was mom and all her friends doing the harvesting, which is pretty typical for native peoples. And then somebody's daughter just really messed up, uh, got the fire out of control. Uh, it's, uh, I'm saying that only because we know that historically women were in charge of the fields. Uh, I don't mean just doing the work, they owned them. Uh, and I, some of the territory may have been, it may have been divvied up the same way, but if someone did a lot of work uh, for us to find millions of these things in single holes in the ground. Um, there. Uh, Gail Wagner, a, a friend and colleague of South Carolina, took the picture on the left of the plant. That is from a scanning electron microscope. Again, and I, I mentioned that there is a possibility that this plant was domesticated in prehistory uh, in eastern North America, and we're using these seeds, technically, at, at a keen uh, to work on that for a couple of reasons. Number one, they seem to be a little bigger than what comes off wild versions of that plant. And the other thing is the seed coat, uh, technically called a pericarp, that, that's on this thing, is starts to show a different surface characteristic uh, at, at, at later in time. Uh, in prehistory, but we're having to be real careful because what we're seeing is whether or not the seed coat is kind of rough, striated, blah, 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 or smooth, uh, which a lot of people take to mean that it was undergoing domestication. But this particular plant produces seeds that are dimorphic anyway. That is, these things change the way they look during the growing season. They look different in the early growing season than they do in the latter growing season. Uh, so we're still working on that, and these plants are not that easy to find anymore. Not very much, uh, not very easily found at all. Um, but again, to reiterate, uh, this is certainly not everything that people were harvesting. I mean, we're not talking about all the other plants on the landscape, and there are others. I, there are thousands of them, and not everything was being harvested just for food. Uh, a lot of these plants are being harvested for potential medicinal purposes. Uh, for example, the goosefoot. Um, there, there's research suggesting that that plant actually became domesticated not because people wanted it as a food resource, but they were so caught up on its medicinal uh, uh, potential that they kept harvesting and harvesting and harvesting. And that was what initiated the steps into domestication. And then they, oh, well, this tastes pretty good. Let's do these sort of things. And that happens with other plants. And then there are the uh, ritualistic social and ritualistic reasons for uh, selecting plants and using them differently. Uh, classic examples, tobacco. Uh, actually, the tobacco that uh, is typically found in prehistoric sites uh, is not native to Eastern North America. It's actually from South America. Uh, Nicosiana rustica, and it migrated up through Mexico into the Midwestern and Eastern United States. There is a native tobacco out, way out west that may be involved in this, but the point is, uh, that plant was even grown in a different area than other plants. It was segregated from everything else. It was so important to ritual, uh, social gatherings, and so forth and so on. 
and historically only men were allowed to grow it. So there you go. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I'll tell you, there's been some. I had a, uh, I had a uh, PhD student who did some work on the organic contents from prehistoric pipes from Tennessee and North Carolina and Virginia, uh, because we always hear about the importance of tobacco in ritual with native people. But it's extremely rare to find a tobacco seed. Number one, they're incredibly small. Uh, but you know, why don't we ever find, you know, okay, maybe it's the way they process it. We, you know, they process it where the seeds didn't get subjected to fire. <clears throat> so this, uh, this young man, uh, David, uh, started doing, looking for pollen in the soot uh, of the pipe bowls and also subjecting this organic material to gas chromatography and mass spectrometry. Indiana Jones ain't around no more. Uh, do these things. And what we found out, yeah, we found chemical signatures, or he did, chemical signatures for uh, nicotine in there. That doesn't tell us which tobacco it was. But it was, it was tobacco. But so many more pipes had different things in them, not nicotine. And one of the most common uh, across all of these pipes was a chemical called saffron. You ever heard of it? It is a chemical along with camphor that comes from the root bark of sassafras trees. It is incredibly hallucinogenic. <laughs> it is a precursor to methamphetamines. And the FDA right now regulates saffron. <laughs> and these folks were smoking <laughs> saffron. They smoking uh, sassafras uh, bark. And so, uh, you know, draw your own conclusions. It's no wonder certain individuals were thought to have connections to the gods. Right? <laughs> but, uh, yeah. but anyway, there are so many uh, stories like that about how plants were used other than for food that doesn't even touch things like fabrics. We have uh, 9,000 year old examples of fabric impressions in burned clay from East Tennessee. Uh, that doesn't tell us what the plant material was from which the fabric was made, but we know people were weaving that long ago here. And if you go to the McClung Museum, you'll see a fabric bag sitting in its own display in there that's a little over 2,000, right at 2,000 years old uh, that. Uh, was used uh, obviously to harvest gypsum crystals because there were still some in there. And it also had seeds of domesticated goose foot in it. And it had been repaired five times, different kinds of plant fibers. Uh, so a lot, it's a big investment to weave something like that. And you don't just toss it away and go down to Walmart and get an oak. So they, they repaired it a lot. But anyway, I, I, I'm getting sidetracked here. Uh, I will uh, suggest to you that you keep in mind that, number one, people uh, in Eastern North America, native peoples, have had an intense relationship with plants for thousands of years. Uh, corn, beans, and squash, the squash that most people think about, uh, come much later, much later. Uh, and you should give these weeds a second thought. Uh, I'm pretty good about telling students of mine when we're out in the field somewhere, and we'll see something that's not supposed to be there. That is, it's from another continent. What do we do with this? I pull it out of the ground. You know, I don't, it, doesn't, it doesn't need to be here. It's not going to be good for these native things. It never is. You ever, are you familiar with a tree called Tree of Heaven? Every one of those things should die a horrible death. <laughs> it's just, no, no, no. They're Asian, and they are the tree version of a weed. They, you know, they grow so they grow six feet a year, and they produce thousands of samara, these little wing things like an elm or a maple. And every dead gum one of them that hits the ground germinates, so it doesn't take long for them to get there. And another is a, uh, a tree that's very attractive when it's in flower. A lot of people plant intentionally it's called a princess tree or empress tree. Now that's another Asian import. They're they're the tree version of kudzu, as far as I'm concerned. And you can't go from here to Nashville on I-40 without driving by thousands of these princess trees <laughs> doing these things. But uh, do consider these plants. And if you're out foraging this summer, keep an eye out. Uh, if you locate some of these things on the ground, I'd be delighted to know where they are. <clears throat> They're increasingly difficult to find. 
Most of them, I think, are living in my yard. Uh, oh, I, I'm serious. I plant them. And, and that brings me to this, this one last thing. Um, well, it's underway right now. I am germinating the seeds of many of these plants right now in greenhouses over at the UT Gardens. And I have managed to get them to give me space over there on the ground to restart a native garden that I once had on the hill here at UT. Um, so a lot of these, well, I hope some of these things will be growing uh, at the UT Gardens by sometime this summer, uh, late spring, early summer. Uh, and I will be doing things like a uh, Three Sisters planting uh, out there for some of the educational programming. And there'll be other plants that will be installed and, and that will change every every year. It will always be the same thing. But right now, I'm doing germination tests on the uh, seeds of some of these things. Uh, for example, the uh, sumpweed, uh, one of the oily seed things, which is not supposed to store well. Uh, I had put some of them in a freezer 15 years ago. And uh, they're germinating gangbusters right now. And, I have, and then I have curated many seeds in other kinds of environments, different kinds of temperatures and humidity and so forth. So I'm doing some testing on that right now. Just, to, you know, gee, how long have these people have curated these things but, without using freezers, of course, but, uh, do that. but keep that in the back of your mind if you look for something to do on a weekend afternoon uh, over at the gardens um, is to go look for it and see what we had managed to get up this year. But I have so many of the maygrass plants have germinated. Uh, I'm really thrilled with that. So that, uh, hopefully uh, they'll transplant well and we'll get them out. But I guess I've yammered long enough. Anybody have anything you want to ask me? I have a question. Um, okay, I know there's you know, a lot of annual sunflowers, but what about the perennial sunflowers? Well, What's it's that? difficult to know without getting to see various parts of the plant right. from the archaeological record what we see. Uh, occasionally, uh, parts are a, almost entire tubers uh, from Jerusalem artichoke, right. by the way, it's neither an artichoke or from Jerusalem. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's you know, in my yard. yeah, but it's, it's a native perennial okay. in the sunflower family, and and there are others that um, mm -hmm. uh, it's really extremely difficult to tell them apart because those things all have another have something in common. These very 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 small seeds, mm -hmm. uh, and, and if they've been burned, and you can't look for the hairs and the hair patterns and so forth and so on and sometimes you have to have uh, even colors um, and we do occasionally get things uh, sunflower uh, seeds out of uh, rock dry shelters or caves uh, and I have one I have an image of one it should have been put, put in there I guess where you actually still see the colors the stripes mm -hmm. because it, it uh, was desiccated in the state that way it's 1900 years old uh, but it's hard to do that but, so I can tell you how many of the things we see are from perennial sunflowers. I don't know how to, you know, to tell you how we could ever demonstrate that you know, unless we could find desiccated examples of the entire plant. Okay. Yes, sir. Have you done any sort of like analysis on mortars and pestles, like as to what type of grains they were bringing up? Well, one of the new leading edge technologies for, for this sort of thing is starch grain research. And uh, looking at everything from mortar, pestle, to uh, stone holes, anything that might have been used to process plants, you'll find starch grains many times uh, on that tool. And like pollen, uh, and like the seeds and other parts of the plants, starch grains, if you have a good enough comparative collection to be able to do this, uh, are specific to certain plants. Uh, so, yeah, for example, uh, I'll tell you just, uh, it's not a native plant, but it's a good example of what starch grains are doing, uh, is corn. Uh, for all kinds of time, the, uh, the basic idea had been that uh, what became corn, uh, actually was in the Balsas River Valley of Mexico, uh, a little over 6,000 years ago. And now, out of the Balsas River Valley of Mexico, stone tools out of caves have corn starch grains. 
the, the grains of domesticated corn, not its wild grass precursor, but domesticated corn that are 9,000 years old. Uh, so, yeah. As we can get the, you know, the tools. One of the things that's bad about this is, and I mean this sincerely, uh, especially many, many years ago, archaeologists thought they were doing a really good thing when they would excavate lithic tools or ceramics or whatever out of the ground. And, well, okay, let's go wash this thing and scrub all this dirt off of it. They scrub a clean well, everything's gone. If there was any pollen on there, it's gone. Starch grains, they're gone. Uh, any lipids, uh, there, there are a lot of places now looking, going back to old collections and finding whole ceramic pots. And, of course, there's stuff on the inside of the pot uh, around the walls from whatever was being prepared in them and uh, looking at lipids and say, oh, okay, well, this was animal that was being prepared in here. Or you'll find starch grains or you'll find phytoliths, little silica bodies that are deposited in cells of plants that can tell you what kind of plant it was. Uh, so, it, you know, we're trying to, you know, as we get new technologies uh, and, and learn how to apply them, we're doing things like that. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Um, so I saw that it took a long time between the wild plants and the domestication, almost like several thousand of years. So um, we have a couple people in here, I think from the Seed Savers group, and I was wondering if you might want to comment on some of the loss of our plant diversity currently, because we have a lot of, even, even things like tomatoes that we cultivate, there's a lot of um, loss of this diversity, so if you could maybe kind of... Well, there's a lot of loss of diversity on, on the basic crops that people, people are familiar with now because a handful of international companies have taken it over and they're going to grow what is going to make the most money and I'm not saying it's bad to make money but they're going to do that they're not so much concerned about diversity um, but yes we are losing that um, it just seems a shame because we spent all this time working to domesticate them. Well, just think of apples. Yeah. Uh, there's a mountain range between Kazakhstan and China, which really is the home or turf of apples. There are uh, apple forests there. I mean, just natural apple forests. And that phenomenon is not present anywhere else on the planet. It is the heart, the heart of apples. And uh, there were, even in the United States, not terribly long ago, over 2,000 named varieties of apples. No more. No. Uh, they were selected, being selected for shelf life, uh, sugar content for America's sweet tooth. It's like corn. Everybody wants the good sweet corn. You know, we think, you know, you, I've seen corn in, in grocery stores that can rot your teeth from 30 feet away. It, it just, you know, there's nothing wrong with sweet corn, but it's just these things are being selected for. And a lot of the diversity is disappearing because these plants don't maintain themselves very well without intervention. And uh, another example is, is a look at corn. Uh, I guess the last really terrible thing was, I think, maybe 1973 in the Corn Belt of the United States, there was a rust infestation that just, I mean, laid the harvest low. And the first thing that the United States Department of Agriculture did after realizing that, oh, somebody messed up, is start running to Mexico and Central America, finding the little village subsistence farmers and trying to get germplasm from them from these old open pollinated maize types that sometimes only existed in a particular family. I mean, it, it, that's specific. And those things are now being curated by the USDA in Beltsville, Maryland, and other places. Uh, there's, there's centers in Ames, Iowa, and other places that do that. They do the same thing with sunflowers and other plants. But uh, the diversity <laughs> is a loss also because We've got now, what, 7 billion people. And if things continue as they are and something horrid doesn't happen to the planet, you figure by the time my grandchildren are middle-aged, there could be 12 billion. 
on this planet. You got to feed people. So that means more and more people are going to need things that they can grow local. Climates are changing. By whatever process you want to go with, that's okay. But the fact is that the time is changing. And it has before. And it will again. <clears throat> but how do you, what can you grow here? What can you grow there? Think about the nutritional qualities of some of these, quote, weeds. And think of how easy they are to grow. How difficult they are to get rid of. Uh, those are possibilities to increase diversity, uh, especially as food resources. So, I, and I have a colleague, by the way, who now is at Texas A&M, used to be at Duke, <clears throat> who uh, did research on, on corn. I will go there again. Uh, the usual story is that there's a grass called teosinte uh, in, in uh, West Central Mexico that genetically is the ancestor of all modern corn, all, like, other than the hybrids, you know, all the, all the over-pollinated stuff. <clears throat> and uh, that, that's it. It's a particular species. ZMA's subspecies Parvaglumus do this survey. And they all these studies. Well, this colleague of mine says, I don't think that's what it is. I think there are two other grasses involved with this. Uh, one called Eastern Gamma grass, which is actually native to southeastern U.S. And uh, the other is a perennial teosinte that was thought extinct until it was rediscovered in 1972 in the highlands of Mexico. <clears throat> so she started working with the genetics, trying to breed these things back. And lo and behold, she came up with a hybrid that is a spot-on match genetically for the oldest maize known on this planet. And what it does is bring into this plant the fact that it's perennial. In other words, you wouldn't have to go buy seed every year to replant your corn. Number two, it's much more drought resistant. Number three, it has a natural inhibition to root rot and European corn borers. It's its own pesticide and herbicide. Uh, because of the genes from three different plants that are involved in this thing. So, uh, if, you know, I, I, I would tell you, honestly, uh, she wouldn't, Mary wouldn't get upset if I did because it's been done in print. The, these uh, old line guys who have done the part of the Gloomus thing for many years have in print called her that crazy one. Okay. Uh, but genetics is hard to argue with. Uh, you know, if the gene's there, it's there. Uh, so it's, a, it's an interesting thing that goes on. Uh, but again, the, the diversity thing is, uh, is up to us if you want that bad. I don't much like the idea that some company can have uh, a patent on soybeans. And that, that has happened. Uh, or wheat, whatever it is, or corn. Uh, and I love the one that, uh, oh, it's Starlight. Star, Star uh, back in the mid 70s, maybe, uh, that was developed <clears throat> because it had its own uh, pesticide, uh, genetically developed pesticide inside the plant that would keep European corn borers away from it. Well, it did that. And it also killed most every other kind of insect it got on it, chewed on butterflies, whatever they were. And also, it was not supposed to be for human consumption. <laughs> well, it wound up in the food chain. Uh, I, I, love the, I love the logic. Okay, if people are not supposed to eat this corn, we don't know what the long-term effects of this stuff is going to be. So let's feed it to the pigs and the cattle. Okay? Uh, and then finally, this corn showed up in processed products like corn chips, Doritos. I, I should say brand name. I don't know if it was Doritos. But those kinds of things. All kinds of processed corn, fast foods. Uh, so... Uh, no, so, so I'm not with the old open gene, you open pollinated kind of things myself. Did you say that you'd encourage us to grow our own food at home? Well, if you want to keep these old gene pools alive. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'll be honest and tell you right up front, I, I, I'm not heavily European on this franken food thing. Uh, some of it, I, I'm, not, you know, I, I'm not sure how frightened of it I really am. Uh, but uh, if you're talking about diversity, that, that's going to be up to us. Uh, the big agro companies are not interested in that, uh, except for PR. Uh, that's, you know, at least that's what they demonstrate to me. Uh -huh. Thank you for your time. Oh, yes, sir. Oh, awesome. Go Goose foot's really easy to grow in a garden. And yes. in fact, it's hard to not grow in a garden. Yeah. Uh, it's very productive. Um, 
What about these other ones? Are any of these other ones easy to grow and very productive in a local garden? Yeah, I've grown every one of these things here in Knoxville, and I, I'm going to be I'm starting to grow them again. Yeah, yeah it's, it's it's finding the germplasm that sometimes can be the problem. Yes. What are some good resources to look for identification? You know, if you think you might have some of these, mm -hmm. I mean, it's like <clears throat> I have a yard that six years ago was a field in Loudoun County. And, you know, I have assorted grasses that I have no idea what they are. Well, and, yeah. Uh, there are things like uh, graze manual of grass. And I, I can send you these things, but these are usually right, yeah, things okay. like this. And uh, if you don't get too bored with drawings, mm -hmm. uh, it's about as you know, elaborate as the uh, illustrations we get in most of them. Uh, that, there are several manuals of botany and grasses. But you might consider looking at, uh, and some of you may already be familiar with the Norton Field Guide, Field Guide series. They have field guides on just about anything, wildflowers, trees, so forth and so on. And try that for weeds and grasses. There's a uh, weeds of the Midwest. There's uh, just so many. But I, I would, uh, would start with some of those. The, uh, there's also the, uh, is it the Jefferson Field Guide series? I, I don't know, I, I, I don't want to speak on that. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to think of things that have more than just line drawings. Right. In, in them, or just verbal descriptions that use bo this yeah. intense botanical language that makes you doze off real quick. Well, it's like with Goosefoot, once you've seen the seedling, you know it and you see it next time and it's like, oh, that's what it is. Okay, I'll yeah. leave so much of that in that area. Yeah. It, it's easy to recognize it as goose, but it may not be easy to tell what species it is. Right. There, you know, so, uh, but there's, uh, uh, again, uh, this is goose foot right here. And I've got in here these really pale colored seeds and the black colored seeds. Uh, these are typical for the wild version of this and the pale ones for the domesticated version. Uh, and these other things here, but uh, again, I thank you for your time, especially on a day like this. If you, uh, if you don't have long. any more questions for Dr. Kreitz, feel free to come up and ask him, but we're coming up on an hour now, so I think we're going to call it quits. Feel free to come look at the plant samples up here, get some more food. If you enjoyed the talk, we have a thank you card for Dr. Kreitz, if you'd like to sign that. Um, we're also collecting donations for the foraging group. There's a little box by the door. If you enjoyed this talk, feel free to contribute. So thanks for coming. Uh, let me know if you have questions and feel free to uh, talk to Dr. Kreitz. Let's thank him again for his time.